In this video, I have a very special guest, Fernando Campos. Fernando Campos is uh, a eight-figure seller. Um, right now, his focus is more on agency for big brands. Um, he sold more than 80 million in uh, sales since 2014 and he is someone that we could all learn so much uh, from. Now, in this video, this video is very special because um, we are covering very, very advanced topics and topics that usually people don't talk about. And the, 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 the nice thing is that all these topics are packed in one video. Usually each topic will be like an hour long. Uh, so make sure that you watch the entire video so you can get the most value out of it. Now, before we're getting into the video, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and click the bell. So for every new video that I release, you can get updates and notifications and leave a comment. I subscribe so I can personally reply to your comments. And let's start with the video. Okay, so I'm very excited to welcome Fernando. Um, this is our guest for today video. And you know, when I started to sell on Amazon, I told you this before the call, uh, I was part of your like seller trade, trade craft, the Facebook group. And I remember like uh, watching the, the screenshots and the posts and all of that. I was like, like one day, like I wanna be like you. And, <laughs> and you know, like uh, two years after I'm talking with you and it's really a pleasure uh that you are here on the channel as a guest and i'm sure like we we myself and the audience that is going to watch this video is going to learn a lot of things uh why would you introduce yourself to those that don't really know you or uh hear about you thanks so much. yeah that, that means a lot i appreciate it um yeah my name is fernando campos yeah i've been selling on the amazon since like late 2014 early 2015 uh you know we started as sellers doing a lot of you know, the normal home and kitchen OEM products sourced from China. Uh, and we've done well. We've scaled it to, you know, 30 million a year. Uh, we've, you know, done a lot of side projects and things along the way, which has been fun, uh, like, you know, Pixel Fi and other things. Uh, and we've and we've also sold businesses uh, now as well. And, no, and, and sell a trade off, way too many, actually. Uh, but yeah, now what we what we're really focusing on in this like, kind of next chapter of our business is uh, Marketplace Ops, which is one of the leading uh, brand management agencies. We work like in a turnkey fashion. I think what we set us apart really is like kind of strategy and technology uh, to work with a lot of like fast growing CPG companies that want like real experts uh, working on their on their Amazon presence, not, you know, maybe just like a Joe Schmo or a former Amazon employee, uh, whoever that might be. Uh, but yeah, I mean, all in, we've sold about $80 million uh, in those years. Uh, the majority actually coming from our own brands. That's, that's very cool. Um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the need for what you just explained, like uh, services for big brands, I think it's uh, something that came right on time because I hear that a lot of big brands and companies and you look at their PPC management or in the listings they have, and it's like a joke, you know, they have all these budgets, but like they're not like really utilizing all their potential or even half of it. So that's really cool. Mm -hmm. So you you guys sell on Amazon currently or are you only focusing on like uh, the, the agency? Yeah, so I would say it's kind of like an 80-20 thing. Like the majority of our time is really spent on the agency and and really setting up the infrastructure it's it's very different we realized like in the beginning it was like, oh it's the same thing you know we just do it for our clients and you know i think there's obviously like other aspects of running an agency that you don't necessarily like get into until you're uh you're kind of knee deep i guess you would say but um yeah so the majority of our time right now is truthfully spent on the agency and then we do have like some of our own like supplement products and stuff like that but um, yeah, it's definitely an 80, 20 thing towards the agency. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Okay. So I'll start with a couple of questions that I have for you, if it's okay. Uh, I hope yeah. you have enough time for all of them. I did, uh, prepare a lot of questions. Uh, we'll start with, uh, you know, I'll, I'll start maybe asking you at the beginning when you started your Amazon, uh, business and when you were like a big seller, because the, the, the question is more related to that, more to people that are interested to sell on Amazon. But 
what was your why? Why did you start this? And like, wh- why you got into Amazon and not some some other uh, opportunities? You would say. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, so at the time, we knew that we wanted to do e-commerce, and it was we we wanted to start a business. We knew that I wanted to be in e-commerce because a lot of our friends were doing e-commerce, and my business partner Nick and I had come from tech. And uh, we weren't technical, so we didn't know how to develop software. And so like e-commerce was like a good intersection of like still being in like a tech related industry, but you know, that business guys could do. And so e-commerce was kind of like the, the route that we chose. Uh, and yeah, I mean, truthfully, we, we tried building our own website and stuff like, you know, similar to Shopify, uh, like early on, we, we were on a bootstrapped like budget so we didn't want to invest a ton into advertising and we'd already quit our jobs so we kind of had this like theoretical clock uh you know ticking against us in terms of when we would run out of money and you know have to go live with our moms and so yeah i mean we tried building the own website for like a few months we realized like oh you know doing content and growing organically is going to take a lot longer than we have and then so it was just like okay well how can we make money quickly? And then, you know, we'd heard of all these people doing like really successful eBay businesses, which is kind of funny now in, in retrospect. Uh, but yeah, we, so we started looking at like Terapeak and thinking about like, okay, how, what are we going to do? And we're like, okay, CrossFit's getting pretty big. Maybe we should do like products for CrossFit. And then, yeah, one day we just like received an Amazon package. We were working at my business partner's uh, apartment. And then, you know, it was just like, hey, like, why are we going to sell on eBay if we can sell on Amazon? And then it was like, it, at the time, it wasn't even like well known that you can sell on Amazon. And then so yeah, just basically one thing led to another. And it's just like, okay, like, screw eBay, like eBay, yeah, but whatever, like, we want to do Amazon, like, it's still like really early. And we know that momentum is shifting that way. Um, and why was honestly, like, we just wanted to start a company. Like, I mean, it was like, truthfully like you know part of it is that desire to be your own boss like it's you know dr- pro- like, par- like truthfully partially driven by ego but a lot of it was honestly like reading the four-hour work week which is just like so inspiring to so many people at, at that like my 20s and 30s that like really changed my like view of like work and and work-life balance i would say yeah yeah true uh, i agree with what you said like the four hours i mean this business totally can be managed with if you're smart like if you have like good systems like four hours it's something that achievable a week for amazon business i mean once you start to see success obviously you you want to do more so you get into new areas and new things and new uh projects uh but i'm still every day uh, when I compare my life now to the life that I had with my previous like business, where like it's physical location with employees and you have to be their presence, I'm like so grateful that I can do what I do. And, you know, I cannot really change the way that I, I see life now. I will never, you know, go back to something that requires me to be there. Like, for example, if I'm not going to work for a week, like the VAs that I have and everyone will still run it, you know. Maybe the project, the progress will not be as, you know, uh, as good as I want with some new things, but like, operating it, like, yeah, definitely. So this is, this is amazing. Um, mm-hmm. from, from your uh, experience, I know that, you know, this is a question related to, like more to a mindset about like um, being around like successful Amazon sellers. Um, w- what what you saw like are good traits of successful sellers like what they do differently i see a lot of people uh that started same time as i you know started and they either quit or their progress is slow of course at the other end you have people started the same time as me and they're like 10 times bigger than me so curious to hear from you what what is your take about it because you have many people saying oh i want to make it on amazon i want to be successful but you know it just doesn't work for them so what is the traits of successful Amazon sellers that you saw? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, yeah, I, I would say there's like, there's kind of like, I, I guess, like three groups, I would say. You know, there's like the biggest group, which is everybody that starts learning and is interested in Amazon, right? And then like 
you know, those are the people that join in Facebook groups, they ask all the questions. They're typically the people that never order a product and they don't really like get really past uh, like the research phase. I think what like separates that group probably from the next group, which is actually the people that end up making money is truthfully that they, they had the guts, I guess, and maybe the financial wherewithal, whatever to, to place that first order whether it goes spectacularly well or poorly, it's like, it's, you know, truthfully, they just had the guts to do it. Um, and I think, you know, from there, like most likely you're going to either end up with like a failure or truthfully, like it, depending on when you started, it could be like a six, seven figure business. It's just really that like that, you know, yeah, I guess initiative, I guess you would say to actually really like pull the trigger because I think no matter what, like as long as you didn't like choose the most like, ridiculous category, you'll probably sell some units and like you could lose, you know, maybe a few grand, but like we did like truthfully, but like we learned like, okay, like we need to differentiate our products more. We need like, uh, we need to like really focus on margins more. And so because we did that, like, you know, in the next round we got better and then we just got better. And then like, that was where we scaled. And then, and then I think, you know, separating that from like the last group, uh, which is, you know, the people that would probably scale, you know, to the higher seven figures, eight figures, even nine figures is like really probably like networking and team. I would say like, you know, I, I think there's, you know, obviously like room for tactics and experimentation and everything. But if I think about like, especially the people that are scaled to like eight and nine figures, like no question, it's like, it's about team, right? Like how do you scale yourself? Uh, because there's only like a certain amount of hours in a week. Uh, I don't think I've ever met like an eight figure, like, I, I mean, a handful of eight figure sellers that don't have like at least a small team. Um, and so I, I think that's probably where like you kind of just start like the people weeding people out. Um, yeah, I think the networking is obviously a big thing. Like there's, you know, there's a ton of like groups out there like, that are more high level that are kind of sharing tactics and like, and talking about, you know, things broader than just Amazon, you know, how they're investing, you know, how they're building teams, how they're implementing EOS, all that kind of stuff. And so I think like uh, that transition of like running like your, like that middle phase, I guess, is kind of like you're a small business and you're like really working in the business. And I think transitioning to that larger seller is when you're like really starting to think about like, how do I manage people? How do I like set a vision? How do I um, like implement OKRs? All that kind of stuff that kind of helps you transition. Yeah, 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 I, I agree like 100% with you. I think I will add one more thing. I think the desire also, it's something that is super, super important, like desire to, to be successful, because if you don't want it bad enough and some mm -hmm. obstacles will come, you would just like, uh, you know, just let it go or say ah, it doesn't work or it doesn't work it. But you see those people that are just keep pushing and they have this burning desire to, to be successful or to meet their goals um i i see it with people that, that i talk with or try to help and they you know they fail because they don't really have enough like strong desire they don't really it doesn't really push them or motivate them to really wake up and take action because you need to take a massive action to really start this thing and and scale it and it's not easy um yeah thank you for the answer um so mm -hmm. you you mentioned something about networking it's a big part so how how you will use networking more like a tool that can help you grow and, and like build your business then uh sometimes it can suck you up like to be like a social socializing thing you know just talking about things that are not related and you know to be honest i don't like this part you know i have mm -hmm. my my friends and all of that and that's fine but at the same time, I don't want to be like, you know, not rude, but, you know, like the purpose here is to network about the Amazon. Sometimes it's light and you, it's becoming like a different thing. How you approach this? I know you're a very busy person. Yeah. So, OK, I can totally relate. I, I can understand that, like, you know, sometimes, you know, people are talking about sports or drinking a ton you know uh, i'm guilty of that but like you know it, it can be it can be easily just become like a, a time waster i guess I, I think about two things like one is that like are you in the right room right like if you're like you know typically the biggest seller in that room you're probably in the wrong room right like you want to like be in a room surrounded by people 
that can push you and challenge you that are in similar places in terms of like see like you know skews maybe in terms of like revenue in terms of team size so that you guys can like you know naturally balance ideas of each other and then the second piece is is really like i guess digging deep in terms of like why uh why is the socializing part bad because i i i think um what's unique about amazon right is that like there's like it's, it's a big enough space where like all these kind of like masterminds are starting that are super focused on one, like one industry but if you look at like let's say like ypo uh or eo those are all like cross industry masterminds right and what you know so they can't talk about the technical side of amazon like uh, as well because like, you know, everyone's in different industries. But yeah, they can talk about like, you know, managing people and stuff like and those kind of challenges. Um, but like, you know, if someone's like, hey, my launches aren't going well, like no one in the room is gonna be able to answer you, right? And so I think the socializing part is important because it creates like a community of people that you can relate to since like a lot of time, you know, majority of this industry is like, or space is like, solo entrepreneurs right so they don't have like in theory like colleagues of like uh of real peers yeah. uh but i think the second piece is like the socializing aspect creates a level of trust that i think is really important that allows you to uh to reach out to that person and like ask them for help so like you know if we get you know drunk let's say in, in mexico and then we have like a bunch of shots and stuff like i have like a better connection to you even if we didn't talk about work in the, in the beginning but like afterwards you know like we'll get connected on facebook and then like let's say i want you to teach me this new influencer strategy that you're working on like yeah. you're way more likely to do that because we had that shared experience versus if i just like randomly messaged you on facebook and so i would say that's like where probably I would, I guess, maybe differ a little bit where I would think that part is really important. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm still like, uh, like thinking about this and really like asking opinions from many people about this. Uh, but I, I agree with actually with what you said about this personal connection, but it just, you know, limits the amount of people you can create connections with because you cannot get to, to a deeper level, like you said, with many, many people. What I'm thinking is just like, choose like uh, a maximum of like five people that you like, that you know that they are also connected to other people and then you create yourself like kind of a big group. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, totally. do, do you spend like time and money like for on masterminds or like coaches, like improving areas that you, you know, you're, you're weak at. I constantly like pay for courses and I really like uh, improving myself. I think that's the best investment that I do in my business like investing in myself totally yeah i mean i think that's i think it's great i think we invest a lot like we um we, we just hired an annual planning coach we've had uh ceo coaches or business coaches uh were in some of the high level masterminds of like eight nine figure sellers like really small ones uh we're in mds um yeah we're in other ones that are like you know just like you know for kind of just all like all to entrepreneurs i'm in ypo as well um yeah i mean i wouldn't say we are, we're, we're definitely really big in terms of investment uh investing in ourselves i think it's one of the most important things that you can do like once you have like the profit uh, to be able to justify it i think that's like truthfully how you make less mistakes is that you learn from people that are a little bit further along And yeah, I mean, it's great. Like, I, I think I'm one of the youngest people like in like my YPO chapter and like yeah, forum for sure. And yeah, I mean, I, I learned so much about like, you know, raising families and like uh, marriage and, um, you know, business partnerships, like investments and things like that, that I, I that I get to, um, you know, benefit from the like, years of experience of, of people that are a little bit further along. Yeah. How old are you, if I may ask? I'm 34. 34. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, What about you? Uh, I'm 32. 32. Nice. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like people sometimes, you know, even if they make profits, they it's hard for them to spend like five or 10K on something. But I realized that you spend this 10K, but it gives you like 100K. So the, the return on those like uh, 
investments it's like super high so like definitely mm-hmm. i recommend that people like spend money on, on things uh so um this question i think that i asked you about like what is your focus the next next question is about cash flow i know that you said you sold like for 80 million dollars i know that you've been with uh with your partner with the uh, nick um and how how you were able to to really use cash flow uh before i call i told you that i might get uh to be a partner with a big company and what they bring to the table is cash flow and capital and that will help me grow faster so uh did you have any investors did you how with the beginning was when you scaled to eight figures like how you manage capital and cash flow Yeah, that's good. Wait, so just to make sure that uh we didn't sell the business for 80 million. It's uh, we've sold 80 yeah. million in in, yeah, yeah, in GMB. Yeah, revenue. Um yeah, yeah, yeah. Um yeah, like what did we do? So, I mean, I think it depends on the stage. Like our progression was yeah, zero like from the beginning we came in with like 30k And then we we placed like we placed a lot of inventory so we like we probably spent like 15k I would guess in the, in the first like few products like right out the gate uh, once we started like getting traction then we went to friends and family and raised another like 60k maybe like within like I would say four or five months and then it was kind of like almost like you know in those video games where you're getting to each checkpoint and then you get more time it's like very similar to that but like getting more money and then so It was like, you know, we get to the next, you know, revenue threshold and profit threshold. And then we'd ask for like 100K or 150K. I think for the first year and a half, we were just doing like really uh, like friends and family that would give us incredible rates or paying like really expensive, like almost like predatory lending just because even like 17, 18%. Uh, I think that was with deal struck maybe like eight months in. But again, just like really just trying to get to each milestone and reinvesting everything i think uh about a year a year and a half in we were able to get an sba loan uh you know like as an american company i think that was huge where we got 350k at like i don't know five percent interest over 10 years so it came out to like 4k a month it was nothing um so that was incredible that got us to like the next stage and then i think we started uh you know, just like leveling up our like fundraising ability. So I was just spending more time fundraising actually. And then, so we probably raised, I don't know, like one and a half million all in, give or take in just debt uh, over the years, just like paying back, like uh, getting a promissory note, paying it back, getting a promissory note, paying it back. Um, and then, so that I think like really, really helped us. Obviously it doesn't dilute the company since it's just debt without warrants. Um, and then, yeah, I think what we started too late that like, we probably started doing maybe two and a half years in, uh, we was really getting like good credit terms from our suppliers. And so I think I wish we would have done that earlier. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think learning about like, you know, cash conversion cycles, which, you know, for those that aren't like where it's just like the, the difference in time from when you pay your supplier to when you receive cash and that receiving that cash is coming from Amazon is like, you're basically in a, in a simplified way, your cash conversion cycle. And th- there's a great article in like Harvard business review about like how fast can your company afford to grow. And it just talks about like your margin profile versus like your cash conversion cycle. And based on that, without external cash, you have a, a basically a, projected growth rate and then so basically we used like um credit terms to basically help shorten our cash conversion cycles and just like over time like just per, like a progression like getting negotiating a little bit more a little bit more and then a little bit more with our suppliers and then that allowed us to uh to continue to, to continue to scale and those like further years Yeah, I think it's a big part. Like you, sometimes people focus on getting all, all these loans and, and SBA loans and credit card debt, but simple like little trick or hack by getting your suppliers, giving you uh, payment terms like next 60, net, net 60 or ni- net 90 could really be a game changer. Any tips? Like did you have to travel to China to have a meetings with them or like what was the process in getting them? I know you said you kept negotiating more and more. So that's the process for me too. At the beginning with the, my biggest supplier, 
he gave me like the ability to place like an order for 10,000 uh, units and I will ship only 2,000 and pay what for I'm shipping. Now he's more flexible, but curious to hear how you got the payment terms. Yeah, I mean, so I think about it. Yeah, I, I would think about your investor as like a true business partner, you know, like if you, if you like read Vivid Vision or like, you know, like, you know, your supplier is like one of the most important relationships, right? I think a lot of people have kind of adversarial relationships with their suppliers. Like, you know, they're constantly like nickel and diming them or like, you know, being rude to them or whatever it may be. I think, you know, it starts off with just having a great relationship where there's a lot of trust. Uh, I would say it's also just preparing. Like you're basically, if you're getting like what you said, like if you're getting a loan basically from your supplier through credit terms, don't think about it as just like, hey, I'm having another call with my supplier. But think about it like as if you're asking for an investment. Like if you were going into like, you know, I think a lot of people will go into a supplier meeting like, hey, like, hey, Joe, like, how's it going, blah, blah, blah. Versus like, if you like kind of come in like almost as if you were pitching a, an investor, you would you would think about it like, or I would think about it very differently. And so I would like think about like, okay, here's a plan. Here's what we've done before. Like, this is what, if we get these credit terms, here's like the product roadmap. Here's how we're going to scale. This is how it benefits you. This is how it benefits me. Like we're in this together. And then you have like some like kind of basic forecast projections. They like see like, oh, wow. Like in terms of COGS, like this is my number. Like this is where it's going to go from, you know, 10,000 a month to $50,000 a month. If I just give them this guy net 60, like, do I think this guy can do it? And and then, you know, it's kind of thinking about it from that approach. Uh, and yeah, I think one other thing that we did that I think was helpful is like, naturally it's like scary, right? For you're like a manufacturer, you're, you're trusting somebody in the beginning, you're not really sure. You maybe haven't been working that long uh, together. Like, I think one of the things we did was like using the Telex release as like kind of like a good milestone in the beginning. And then so, basically the telex release is like basically when the product like the shipment's about to like arrive at the port or wherever it's going like in the manufacturer needs to provide a telex release to the uh, freight porter you know this but like it's basically a like good checkpoint where like the manufacturer still has the upper hand and so if you haven't paid by that point they can not give you the telex release and then you can't bring the products into the u.s or whichever your market is and so what we did was we were like hey how about the telex release then like we'll pay you the last the, the balance payment so it gives us another 15 days it's not like major but it's it's basically giving them like uh, a history of trust yeah and then it's like hey like look if we do this it can extend out further and then that's kind of the way we would go about it yeah yeah great great tips i think that like what you said like if you come prepared with forecasting with uh planning and you come to this call or this conversation prepared they gonna take you more seriously. There's no like uh, shortcuts. If you just come as a, some some sighting, oh, can I get payment terms? Most likely they will say no. So if you plan, if you totally. guys plan to you know get payment terms, make sure you do research. You come prepared when you ask this. Uh, oh so, yeah, and uh, talk to the owner. I would say talk to the right? owner. Like if you're working with a sale, yeah, talk to the owner if you can. Okay. Um, because. I mean, who's going to like approve it? You know what I mean? It's not the salesperson. It would either be like the finance person, depending on the size of the business, or it's going to be the owner. And so I think the earlier you have a relationship with the owner and like the better that relationship is, then the, the more likely uh, you're going to get the terms that you want. Yeah, that's more. I actually talk directly. I mean, I have a very good connection with the salesperson. Uh, so, but, but it's a good point. You know, it looks different when you speak like with the owner uh, rather than the salesperson, plus you have like more authority. He's this decision maker. Um, so, what do you think about? We talked about this a little bit before the the you know this call. But what do you think about exiting versus keeping an Amazon business? Uh, you know, uh, I, I think that you know what you you said before makes sense. But I want the people to to hear it from you. Um, yeah. Yeah, honestly, it's a tough question. It's like, you know, the million dollars, sometimes many millions of dollars question. Uh, I think so much of it depends on, you know, where you're at financially, whether you're a fam family, age, you know, circumstance, and truly like how you feel about the business. Like, you know, I, I've 
met, you know, many businesses, like business owners, maybe they're both doing 5 million, but one person is incredibly stressed because there's like fires constantly being put out, whether like listings are going down or hijackers or, you know, black hat tactics. And then another 5 million, sell, like 5 million a year seller that's doing amazing. Like they're, they don't have a care in the world. They have a great business partner. They have like a team, like they don't deal with a lot of the support issues. They don't even know if they get bad reviews. Like, and so I think if you feel like the business is like kind of capped out with where you can take it and you're really stressed and you want to take money off the table, I don't think that's a bad idea. I think my advice to anybody is that like, take money off the table when you can somewhere, whether it's through distributions or profit uh, or it's with a plan like, hey, I'm gonna sell in at the end of 2022 or whatever and here's like my milestone that I'm shooting for and it's gonna get me to this exit. I think that's smart. I think um, no matter what, you should be probably building the company as if it could be sold, even if you decide not to. But I think thinking about how you create infrastructure and create an asset is really important that like, is transferable instead of um, instead of like thinking like short term and not thinking about like systems and SOPs and infrastructure operations. I do like as much as I hate those areas of running a business. I think they're incredibly important, and so I, I would be thinking about those things like um, earlier than most people want to. do. Really well said. I can add one more thing because I'm right now in the process of my selling part of it. And I suggest that you guys, like if you're planning to sell, just uh, get as many, uh, uh, you know, people to give their idea or their opinion about the specific deal that you have, but don't really listen to each person and then like get all the opinions and then decide based on your situation. Like Fernando said, it really depends on million things. Uh, it could be your your uh, what you really the confidence level in your brand, in the products, the stress level, the capital that you have. It really depends on many many questions. So it really individual question, I think. Um, but yeah, thank you for sharing this. Uh, you know, I, I know that we don't really have a lot of more time, but how you mentioned also before about growing, taking your business to the next level. Uh, creating a team, it's something that is super important in my opinion. I know I heard one of your um, talks in New York like two years ago about building a team. You mentioned that you had like back then it was 80 people. Now you said you have like more around 50, but it's it's huge team. Like, But for the small sellers just starting, uh, what will be the tip how to look on outsourcing? Because I think once you change the way that you look on outsourcing and 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 giving people like uh, do like the, because you cannot grow it. You cannot do everything. But once you change the mindset, the, the way you look at it, that's when you start to really um, like, you know, like hire and then of course outsource more things. But what are the tips for smaller sellers? Not jumping from like two employees to like 20, like someone just starting and, you know, any tips about hiring and outsourcing? Oh man. Topic, I know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a lot. There's like, yeah, yeah. I guess. Uh, yeah. We could do a whole conversation on this separately. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I would say like the big ideas, I guess, for, for someone like earlier stage is like, think about how you're spending your time, like try to categorize it and figure out like, what is like the value of each responsibility that I'm covering? Right. Like, Product development is something that's hard to outsource. It's probably one of the last things that you outsource. Like launching products is probably one of the last things that you outsource. Everything else, pretty much, can, like besides creating a vision when you're larger, but like, you know, in, in the early stages, besides those two things, pretty much everything can get outsourced. And so I, I think it's about like figuring out like, okay, maybe you have a product that requires no customer service. So then like, don't, don't worry about that in the beginning. Um, and, you know, maybe the operations like takes longer, like the supply chain side of like inventory planning and logistics and stuff like that. All of that stuff can be done like overseas. You don't need someone. It actually might be better to have somebody in the Philippines because they're in the same time zone as China. Uh, and so I would say it's like thinking about like, if I were to replace this type of work, how much is it going to cost me to get someone that's really, really good, ideally better than me, to fill this responsibility? 
choose it. Yeah. For inventory planner, supply chain, operations, admin role, like all of that can be done like relatively cheap, like cheaply compared to like, I guess, Western wages. And so I think those would be the, like the first things that I think about like graphic design. If you're not a graphic designer, I think that should be outsourced. Um, copywriting. I mean, honestly, like in the beginning, you're not launching that many products. So I think it's something that you should learn anyways. Uh, but those are like one-time tasks, but like support again, like should be outsourced. Um, like all of those like things. And then just really trying to get your responsibilities to be like the really the high value things like product development, launching, and truthfully like managing finances. Uh, as soon as you can, I, I would be like letting go of that. Um, and then I, I think like, yeah, some of the other big things is like, you know, I think often because, you know, wages maybe in Asia or other places are a lot cheaper than Western countries, then people will just have like a low expectation. I wouldn't go in with that mindset. I would expect like this person needs to be better than me. And I need to be like excited to be giving these like responsibilities to this person because otherwise you're not going to do a great job delegating. You're just going to end up doing the work yourself and which kind of feeds the whole purpose. Yeah. Um, so I would just say like, yeah, high, have a higher level of standard. Um, you know, in the beginning, you generally hire generalists instead of specialists. Um, and so you want people that can kind of wear many hats. And so typically I'll just hire someone with, with either broad experience, ideally, or someone that has like the hardest level of experience that I'm th looking at. Uh, and then I can teach them the rest. So like an example might be, okay, I'm going to have them manage like uh all of my launches right for instance and i think that advertising is the hardest piece of like launches so and then it's like okay like i'm gonna find someone specifically with advertising experience but then i'm gonna teach them many chat or if you think many chats harder then you like okay i'm gonna find someone with many chat and facebook ads experience and i'm gonna teach them advertising something to that effect uh but um i think those like off the top of my head are probably the the things for the earlier stages that I would be thinking about. Yeah, yeah, I, you're right. We, I also very passionate about hiring, about outsourcing. Before I went into Amazon, I had like experience of 10 years working with uh, Filipino workers and I, the beginning suffered a lot. One thing I want to add, set the right expectations because if you never hired from the Philippines, you will be shocked at the beginning because most likely you will hire not the A player team at your first and you will waste a lot of time training and then you realize it's the wrong uh, uh, hiring. So definitely, definitely the recruiting process, I think it's the most important thing. So make sure that you, anyone that is hiring, make sure that you put on this stage, the, the recruiting process enough time or even like the most focus should be there because if you hire someone that is good and teachable, can follow instructions, um th th that's everything because you're not going to waste time training and then getting frustrated and people sometimes getting frustrated and thinking that it doesn't work it doesn't work hiring people from the philippines or uh from you know uh other countries and and it's a very important uh part um so let me ask you one more uh thing uh before we wrap it up i do have more and more questions but i feel this <laughs> is an important question as well um how do you, do you recommend to uh, Amazon sellers to go off Amazon to retail like Walmart, CVS, Walgreens? Uh, what, what is your take about this? And does it like good idea to everyone who is it good for? Um, great question. I, I think it depends. Uh, yeah, and I hate, I hate that answer because I, I don't think uh, it's it's that clear cut. Um, I think if you have an innovative product that has broad mass appeal, then yeah, maybe retail could work. Um, I would say it, it, I would not consider retail even like Walmart and, and Shopify until like I'm at like probably a 3 million run rate. Why 3 million? Uh, it's a kind of an arbitrary number to be honest. Um, but I think at that stage, you're, you've now kind of like, you've hit enough like monthly profit and everything. You've kind of like figured certain things out that it's going to allow you to, to start like building a team and starting investing and stuff. Um, 
into new channels and stuff like that. Because a lot of the biggest sellers that I've met are the guys that only focused on Amazon and they just diversified across accounts instead of diversifying off the other channels. I, I think there's no really like wrong way about it. I think, um, but like retail, for instance, you just need a different set of skill sets. Like you need like a more of a, you know, business, business, like B2B sales experience. Uh, you need to ideally have connections with buyers or work with a broker. You need to have like, uh, like really good, like three PLs in place that have like, you know, uh, that have the labeling experience and the operations is a lot more challenging. And then also like the payment terms can also be like, uh, they're all, they're all almost always worse uh, because you have like net 60, net 90, the best is net 30 uh, where like, you know, Amazon pays every two weeks. And so I think that it's, it's almost like, uh, I mean, it is a completely different business. And so um that, that's like retail. Walmart's easier of a transition, but I think like the the best people that I know at Walmart, if they're not focused on Walmart, like, you know, if you're thinking comparing like their Amazon to their Walmart, it's like, you know, probably five to 10% of revenue. And so I think that if you're looking at the five times or 5%, then you're looking at like, it's 20 times the effort uh, to like, to get the same results. And so I think while it can be like really easy, uh, I, I think about like the flywheel and like, will Walmart like support your flywheel of Amazon, prior, like, you know, before 3 million in revenue a year? Or like, is that time better spent launching another product um, that can help you get closer to that 3 million? Um, Shopify I think is really hard. Like, I mean, at least from, from our experience, it's just like, it's, again, like a completely different business. You have to like more different skill sets. And so I, again, I wouldn't prioritize it until you have the ability to like really dedicate, like learning to like learning that model as well. Do, do you think that it's better to learn it yourself or just give like, you know, like brokers or people, that's what they do, uh, like the job. I mean, anyway, you'll have to be involved and learn. So yeah, I mean, it doesn't really matter. I heard from a good mm -hmm. uh, colleague of mine that you, you also need to be prepared. One risk is that let's say you start working with retailers like Walmart, and the product is selling well, they want like orders soon. You need to be prepared enough stock because you don't want to burn the relationship with them. They will don't look at you in a good light kind of. Uh, so Totally, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's one aspect. And then you also need to sell the product. So like most Amazon sellers don't have enough brand awareness to do really well in retail and like drive people to the stores. Because if you, if you don't have the right sell through, then they'll cut your product. And it's hard to get that meeting again it's not like you can just go like hey i know i didn't sell that much the first time like can we try it again like you yeah. know a year later or six months later it's like you're you're kind of you get one shot and then you know and then you have to wait till the buyer changes or some a good amount of time changes and so at least for the majority of amazon sellers like you know i, I would assume they haven't invested enough in their brand to really like do well in in retail um uh, yeah unless you're going into like um like a like a off market like you know off price one like tj max marshalls i think you can do that uh but you just have to like again be really um uh, yeah i i don't want to make it generic uh but like i think you have to like really have a hard look of like what is the channel do I, what value am i bringing and do i have like what it takes to compete there because uh, like TJ Maxx, like, yeah, you don't need a strong brand, but you need like really sharp price points and, and pretty good infrastructure. And, uh, and they're not going to write POs. So you just need to have like enough of a balance, a strong enough balance sheet to, to basically be able to sell slower, sometimes sell faster and then reorder more to hit their expectations. Um, yeah, Walmart is yeah completely different. Like, yeah, you need to have something kind of differentiated that's either going to bring people into their stores or like and really sell through against everything else they have there. Um, and so, yeah, they're just different problems solved even within just like the retail bucket, if you will. Yeah, yeah, amazing, amazing tips. I'm sure many people will learn and learned a lot of uh, things with uh, uh, this video. Uh, now, to those that are interested to learn, maybe, you know, the audience here is just like uh, many of them beginners, so it might not be right now the right audience for your services, but, you know, uh, just giving exposure to what you do? 
where we can find you. What is the website name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, um, yeah, you can learn more at marketplaceops.com. Uh, yeah, then if you have any questions or anything, want to get in touch, just feel free to re reach out uh, via email. It's just Fernando at marketplaceops.com. Uh, yeah, and I'm happy to answer any questions or at least point you in the right direction if you guys have any questions. Yeah, you're amazing. A true inspiration for myself and I'm sure for many, many <laughs> other people. So really, thank you. I appreciate you uh, coming as a guest here. And, you know, sometime in the future, I'll be glad to continue with the rest of the questions that I have. I know it's more <laughs> uh, busy. But yeah, thank you again, Fernando. Yeah, man, anytime. Thanks so much for having me, Tomer.